Right. All right. I guess we are live now. So hi, everybody. Welcome to this panel where we're going to re-examine Schumpeter's legacy, which I think is pretty uh, damn time considering that we're all now coming up with innovation analysis arguments in competitional across the world. And we're all assuming this is because we're following in Schumpeter's footsteps. But we're going to see today why we might be wrong or right. We'll have a bit of a debate. Um, I am Magali Eben. I am a lecturer at the University of Glasgow, and uh, I am on the board of IBCI, which is a wonderful organization. I will introduce our two co-panelists, which is Aisha Gizemiasa, who is a PhD candidate and lecturer at Sciences Po, and whose wonderful paper, paper inspired this panel. And then we've got Francisco Costa Cabral, who is lecturing with me at the University of Glasgow. So we're gonna start by hearing Aisha just set out her paper and her main thoughts. Um, and then Francisco and I will tune in with our reflection. So Aisha, the floor is yours. Thank you, Magali. Okay, I'm just gonna share my screen because I have a few slides that I will use just as indicators. I mean, it's a pretty, pretty academic paper as, as you know, and oops, gotta start at the start. Okay, um, but uh, I tried to put in a bit of, uh, a bit of the, the discussion in the paper into the slides to make it easier for people to follow. Uh, but uh, I hope we can we can go into further detail in the um, in the discussion and also of course anybody who wants to read the paper <laughs> it's also available uh, on the SSRN or they can contact me for it. Right. Okay. So re-examining Schumpeter's legacy. Um, what does that mean? Uh, I would like to tell everyone about how I got to this point first, because as you already know, you, you too. <laughs> um, I'm doing my PhD on disruptive innovation. And one, when we say disruptive innovation, of course, this sparks up uh, images of creative destruction and Schumpeter immediately. But then uh, I, when I started reading Schumpeter, I realized that the way he's portrayed in competition law and economics it has, has very little to do with, with the actual Schumpeter. And and uh, as I suppose someone who loves to read economic history, <laughs> uh, I, I took some time to, to dig deeper into his, into his works, uh, going beyond the most famous one, uh, Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy, and also this excellent book called Profit of Innovation by one of the greatest economic historians uh, of the 20th century, Thomas McCraw, that uh, gave me a much better understanding of Schumpeter's vision, as he called it himself. And then, uh, since uh, he's an important figure for my thesis, I decided that before I can move on, I'd like to get set the record straight about, about Schumpeter, especially, like Magali said, in, in, in the context of digital markets, uh, we hear his name all the time, and we have proposals of Schumpeterian competition law, but also at the same time, his ideas about you know, innovation incentives, the way they are portrayed, they also play a role in how we, to what extent we integrate Schumpeter into our uh, economic thinking in general. I'm not just talking about competition law, of course. Um, so yeah, okay. Uh, I will first start out with what I think competition law knows about Schumpeter. And the answer is, in my opinion, not that much. Because one thing I realized is uh, when I read these papers, it's a lot of them are based on, and, and I'm not saying this in a bad way, right? Because I did the same thing when I was working on my master's thesis. I read uh, the uh, create, uh, Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy is obviously the most famous, uh, his most famous work. Uh, I read uh, some pages of it, uh, the chapter on creative destruction and some of the selected passages from monopolistic practices. And, and then I decided, ah, yeah, indeed. What he says is monopoly promotes innovation. And then, of course, uh, we set him against Arrow, and then there's the inverted U with uh, Aguillon and everything. And then I, I very you know, cleanly set it out in my master's thesis. But it turns out you know, the PhD that allows you to dig deeper that <laughs> showed me that that's wrong. But uh, anyways, let's, let's, let's get started. So just a few things uh, that I see a lot uh, in, in the Schumpeterian discussion in competition law, of course, uh, creative destruction or his understanding of innovation is, uh, we say that it is the, we, we cite that, uh, he said it's the essential fact about capitalism. And this is the competition that matters is the competition from the new commodity, new technology, new source of supply, uh, the new type of organization, 
and and in general uh, a new way of doing things. Uh, and he also said that this is the type of competition that disciplines before it attacks, and we have to judge its performance over time as it unfolds through decades or centuries. And in the end, he concludes this chapter, uh, chapter seven of Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, by saying that any depiction of capitalism without creative destruction is like Hamlet without the Danish prince, which is a really, really widely cited uh, phrase from the, from the chapter. And then we go on to the, the next chapter, it, which is monopolistic practices. And here there are some passages, again, that we see a lot in the competitional and economics uh, discussion of Schumpeter. It's the idea that there are superior methods available to the monopolist, which are not available to the crowd of competitors, or the advantages that are attainable only at the monopoly level, uh, for example, because the monopoly enjoys a higher financial standing. And, uh, and he also says that this is this type of superiority is the the you know the outstanding feature of the large scale unit of control of the day. And he also says that uh, the exceptionally high profits, which is in competition, are often translated as monopoly profits, uh, are the profits that are the bait that lure capital onto untried trails. Which means these are the monopoly. The, the idea of monopoly profits are are what pushes uh, entrepreneurs to innovate. This is how he's translated uh, in competitional. And of course, we also see that he says they largely about big business and, and, and uh, about big business, especially. Uh, they largely create what they exploit. Uh, and then once again, this is translated in competitional uh, in terms of uh, its uh, competition for the markets or, or successive monopolies type of thinking, which I'm gonna get to, to in a moment. And he also says that what we, we have to accept that this is the engine of uh, engine of economic uh, progress. So how this has been translated in competition, especially he, the, these passages from uh, from monopolistic practices, is uh, the idea that Schumpeter said monopolies and or big business promote innovation, and this is called the Schumpeterian thesis or the Schumpeterian hypothesis. And, um, and we have many examples of this, starting actually in the 60s with Scherer's work. Um, and, uh, and, and I mean, I, I put some examples, but there, there are many of them. And as I mentioned, in this context, uh, he's interpreted as uh, monopoly, the, the, the comfortable seat of monopoly allows, uh, it's the ideal platform for, for shooting at the rapidly and jerkily moving targets of new technology. This is again citing Schumpeter. Um, Sharon does that. Um, Gilbert's work, once again, even his recent work interprets Schumpeter as saying that large firms provide a more stable platform to, sorry about the typo, to invest in research and development. Uh, and Schumpeter praised monopoly as a source of innovation. And one, again, Shapiro, Shapiro's famous paper about uh, reconciling Schumpeter uh, and Arrow, he says in this paper that Schumpeter argued that large established firms operating in oligopolistic markets are better able to finance R&D than, uh, than small firms operating in autom uh, atomistic markets. Oops, sorry. Uh, this work has also had an impact on how we interpret Schumpeter in terms of the incentives to innovate, not just that the idea that you know monopoly and big business have higher financial standing or you know better conditions to to invest in innovation, but also in, in terms of the incentives to innovate. And for example, Federico uh, precisely said that the Schumpeterian thesis is a wrong interpretation of Schumpeter. The, the you know the idea that monopoly provides a better you know platform to to innovate, but also uh, he says that it, what Schumpeter said is actually that uh, it is market power. Uh, and post-innovation profits uh, that drives uh, the incentives to innovate in a competitive market. And Shapiro also, uh, in the same paper, actually frames Schumpeter as the prospect of market power and large-scale spurring uh, innovation. And the one thing that we have been seeing, especially in the context of digital markets, is the idea of uh, how Schumpeter interpreted competition and what might Schumpeter in competition law look like. And here, uh, again, as I mentioned, we see Schumpeter as more uh, sort of 
a proponent of competition for the market as opposed to competition in the market. And Schumpeter's work as being framed as, you know, this is just a uh, sort of successive uh, monopolies or temporary monopolists uh, succeeding uh, one after the other in the gales of creative destruction. Uh, and of course, on the one hand side, this leads to a more sort of hands-off uh, enforcement of competition laws. But also, there is now increasingly the idea that if we are to have a Schumpeterian uh, innovation-centric vision of competition law based on creative destruction, that means uh, if we have unilateral conduct or mergers that are targeted to exclude innovation, and this is, you know, you can imagine the case of, uh, you know, Facebook's acquisition of, uh, of Instagram, for example, then these should be uh, further scrutinized. These, uh, and this would be a sort of Schumpeterian understanding of uh, competition law enforcement. And, um, and in a very uh, recent paper, uh, Petit and Thies also uh, indicated that they create a framework for, for Schumpeterian competition law and saying that Schumpeterian rents coming from innovation, uh, just uh, until imitation happens in a market, the initial rents coming from innovation should not raise antitrust concerns, basically. Okay, so this is the gist of how, uh, how Schumpeter has been interpreted in, in competition law and economics. So what I'm saying is that this is not altogether correct. And, and when we re-examine Schumpeter's work, some uh, a completely, in my opinion, a completely different different uh, vision of Schumpeter emerges. And why is that? Um, well, first of all, actually, this is not the order I, 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 I use in the paper, but I'd like to start out this, this um, presentation by saying that for Schumpeter, throughout his entire academic work, the real star, the real innovator is not the monopolist or the, or the, or the big business. I mean, the moment one realizes the importance he attributes to the entrepreneur as the innovator and the entrepreneur, according to Schumpeter, starting with the theory of economic development, which is, I suppose, his uh, earliest uh, out of his great works is sort of the, the earliest one is initially published in 1911 uh, in German. Um, but all the way to the history of economic analysis, which is uh, a posthumously published book, uh, and, I, and I'd like to mention edited by his wife, uh, Elizabeth Schumpeter, who was a great economist in her own right. Um, and when you sort of start with the theory of economic development all the way to the history of economic analysis, one sees that it's always the entrepreneur that is the real innovator in, in Schumpeterian capitalism. It's not the monopolist or big business. And uh, the monopolist or big business is not the source of uh, creative destruction. And this is also clear. So one, once uh, we read the chapters on the demise of capitalism in capitalism, socialism, and democracy, it also the picture emerges that uh, you know, Schumpeter really sees the entrepreneur as the central figure of the capitalist economy. And here we have a really heroic figure, and it's also men, I'm, I'm sad to say. Uh, there's no man, I've never seen a mention of a, of a, of a, of a woman entrepreneur in his works, but uh, anyways, that's just a side note. And it's this heroic man who, uh, who, who wants to get things done and, and actually profit making uh, is, 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 a, is a concern. I mean, it, it plays a role uh, in the entrepreneur's work, but his real, Actually, his real, uh, I mean, his real goal is first uh, the social capital that entrepreneurship begins. And especially here, the role of um, social uh, mobility is extremely important in Schumpeter's depiction of the entrepreneur because entrepreneurship, and you can think of this as sort of the great American dream, it allows, uh, it allows for the entrepreneur someone from all kinds of backgrounds, and this he also describes actually in, in his works, uh, can innovate and become part of the capitalist class. And this is, this is very important, and we'll see why, because the, once uh, innovation becomes a, a be, you know, gets out of the hands of the entrepreneur and becomes a function of big business, uh, then it means actually the demise of capitalism. And this is another really famous quote. We don't see it very much in competition law, but he actually asks this question, can capitalism survive uh, in capitalism, socialism, and democracy? And the answer is no, I do not think it can. And one of the reasons why he thinks it won't survive is this idea of the disappearance of the uh, entrepreneurial function and innovation becoming 
uh, a function of big business, you know, the, the perfectly bureaucratized industrial unit swallowing the entrepreneurial function. And, uh, and he sees this as the breakdown of a social institution because a salaried employee, and he again depicts this uh, in terms of the different psychology of the entrepreneur versus the salaried em employee, he sees the drivers behind these two types as to, to be completely different. And once again, the social mobilization of the capitalist class uh, also uh, disappears. And he mentions economically and sociologically, directly and indir indirectly, the bourgeoisie therefore depends on the entrepreneur and as a class, lives and will die with him. And one thing, one other thing I'd like to mention is that uh, it's not, this is, this is where Schumpeter's idea of venture capital uh, becomes really apparent because he actually had a, had a, he had a vision of, uh, I mean, a very detailed vision of uh, venture capital, although at the time that capital came mostly from banks uh, as, opposed to the, as opposed to today's venture capital model. And, and, uh, and to a certain extent, capitalists who were entrepreneurs once and now uh, have money who can invest in the, in the venture. So the idea that you know, the, the profits that, uh, you know, drive capital to untried trails, it's not here the, the, the bear, the person that, you know, the, or the entity that invests that money and takes the risk is not the entrepreneur, actually. The profits uh, motive there belongs to, to whomever is investing that in that, in that entrepreneur. And the heroic entrepreneur is the, the one who's able to convince the the the, the um, investor to invest in in their uh, in their venture and here he also makes a really clear distinction between the inventor and the innovator and inventor might have a great idea and might be able to uh, you know implement it to a certain extent but the innovator the entrepreneur is the person who can actually get it to the market and disseminate it and he makes a very clear distinction there um, and he also actually talked. Um, uh, to a certain degree about antitrust in his works. And, and one thing I must say is we have to see him in the historical context uh, because this book, especially, I mean, Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy was written uh, during sort of the second New Deal era, uh, after, during and after the, the Great Depression actually. And at the time, uh, especially during the Second New Deal era, the, there was a huge public and political aversion to, to monopolies. And as uh, you know, since this is a competition law community, uh, some of you might already know, uh, might already be familiar with you know the term Arnold's trust busting activity that permeated the New Deal era. And Schumpeter actually, this is this uh, aversion, Schumpeter's aversion to those policies are not maybe they're a bit veiled in his books, but Apparently, in real life, he was really, uh, he expressed his hatred very, very clearly uh, about New Deal policies and even uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who, who is the US president who led those policies. And he actually, about trust busting, this is again, uh, I mean, he has some really brilliant articles as well, one of them being science and ideology. And, and, um, and there he actually really uh, shows that he sees this to be ideology and actually very dangerous for the scientific vision of the economic discipline that he was trying to, to push for. But he thought that this was extremely, this kind of, uh, you know, uh, ideology that uh, you know, admires the virtue of the magic wand of pure competition and despises the monster of monopoly and oligopoly uh, was dangerous for the for the for the integrity of the, uh, of the economic discipline, basically. And also, he was very much uh, himself. He shied away from making any policy suggestions throughout his life. He. That's why it's. I think, in my opinion, a bit strange to say uh, after I got into his works. Uh, a bit strange to say Schumpeterian competition policy because he was a person that really didn't want to make any policy suggestions, including antitrust suggestions. And what he had to say on antitrust was, okay, an all-pervading cartel system uh, might happen and we, with, without any redeeming virtues and we might uh, treat it with antitrust. But other than that, uh, antitrust has, has a very limited role. And he actually, when we think about, you know, uh, those suggestions of Schumpeterian competition policy saying that uh, we, uh, we should scrutinize mergers more carefully or unilateral conduct more carefully when this is trying to hamper innovation, he actually clearly says in Capitalism, Socialism, Democracy that he expected the big concerns 
to fight progress itself. Those who are threatened by, by, by creative destruction, he found it completely natural that they would do all they could to fight progress, to fight the creative destruction, but he didn't find that to be problematic uh, in any way. And what I like to conclude with, uh, at least in terms of his vision, is that uh, all his, so when, I know that the quotes from monopolis, uh, the monopolistic practices chapter, they look like he was praising monopolies for innovation, et cetera. But once we actually get, get a grasp of his vision of the economy, we realize that he actually, and this is present in all his uh, you know, big works, I would say, or at least to the extent I was able to discern them, uh, which includes business cycles, uh, history of economic analysis, and, and capitalism, socialism, and democracy. Uh, it's the idea that uh, he was, when he talks about monopoly, he talks about um, you know, the neoclassical structure um, within its own boundaries. And even in that chapter, I think he was just saying, look, even if I played your game and we look at economy from your lens, even in that context, a monopoly, uh, because the theory of monopoly says monopoly prices will be higher and output, output will be more limited. But even in that, even, even in your structure, that doesn't hold because the monopoly, you know, that you call monopoly will have superior methods uh, that, that, that will allow it to uh, decrease prices or to, a, to the hypothetical level of perfect competition, basically. And he, he had great respect for the, for the marginal uh, revolutionaries like uh, Walrus uh, and, you know, the, the, the emerging neoclassical economists of his time. And we have to also understand that his time um, was the time when, you know, the marginal revolution was happening in the economic discipline and, and neoclassical economics was becoming the, the mainstream. And he found that structure to be really static and excluding of the entrepreneur. He said that very clearly, even though I think as an economist, an economic scientist, he enjoyed, uh, you know, reading about or knowing and talking about theoretical structure. But he also says very clearly, and some scholars actually find this to be a, a, a sort of an enigma in Schumpeter's, uh, Schumpeter's works, but I don't, I, honestly, I don't, I don't find it to be an enigma. Uh, I just think that he, he enjoyed economic, the economics a great deal, even the theoretical parts of it. But he says time and again in all his works that, uh, you know, this, uh, the neoclassical structure is very static and we, uh, we need a, you know, creative destruction is the lens through which to weave uh, the economy and also embed in society because his vision of the economy is not, uh, you know, just abstracted markets and what happens in abstracted markets. He was very much, for example, uh, in the theory of entrepreneurial decline, as we saw, uh, he saw the, uh, this, uh, you know, the, the, the a chance of social mobility being removed from, you know, capitalistic, um, uh, progress uh, to be a, to be sort of leading to the demise of capitalism, whether he or not he believed actually believed uh, that capitalism would fail. That's that's up for debate, and, and we don't know because he definitely wanted capitalism to, to succeed. Um, but anyways, that's just a side note. And finally, he actually had a chance to respond to the um, criticism that that chapter was a defense of monopolistic practice, but that's in the 1946 preface of Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy. And again, he repeats there all his uh, aversion to the New Deal uh, policies of today. And again, he repeats uh, his ideas that the neoclassical structure is uh, the theory of the administration of a given industrial apparatus, but what is much more important is how capitalism creates those industrial structures in the first place. And to conclude, uh, why bother? Why, why am I caring about this, this so much? Well, first of all, for the sake of intellectual honesty, I think if you're gonna put words in somebody's mouth, we might as well know uh, what they're talking about. And, and I greatly enjoyed, and it's also, I suppose personally, I really enjoyed uh, reading his works. And I, I am by no means claiming that I have the full grasp of all his works because he was a very prominent writer and, and I mean, I'm not sure I could go through all these works in my lifetime even, but I think I, yeah, I started at least to get a grasp of, the, of, his, of his intellectual framework. And of course, the second um, 
the second step is, uh, as Thomas McCraw called him, is Schumpeter the prophet of innovation? I think that's something to think about because uh, one, once we think about you know, what's happening in the 21st century, well, there are elements indicating <laughs> that some of the things he said might actually be coming true, like the, um, like the uh, managerial, you know, the huge managerial, managerial units, uh, becoming the innovator as opposed to the entrepreneur, we, he was dismissed a great deal by actually by his critics saying that Schumpeter basically said capitalism would be replaced by so, uh, socialism. That didn't happen. You know, the Soviet Union failed, so Schumpeter also failed in his vision. But uh, he also he also said that you know we have to uh, we have to think about capitalism uh, and 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 measure its progress through decades or centuries. So. It hasn't even been a century since he died, and I think we're maybe uh, rushing a bit too much to dismiss dismiss what he said. And also, we might, I think, as antitrust scholars, competitional scholars, we might be suffering from a status quo bias in the sense that, I mean, um, we are very used to, especially those of us who came to the field in the 21st century, we we are very used to, you know, thinking of competitional enforcement in a neoclassical structure, basically. And you know uh, the economic analysis that supports cases, et cetera, et cetera. But maybe if we t took a step back, and I'm not just saying this in terms of competitional analysis, but if we took a step back and tried to see economy as embedded in society, in his, um, you know, being inspired by his vision, maybe some some other solutions or some other visions for the future might emerge. Uh, I'll conclude here. I already spoke too much, and I look forward to the to the discussion. Thank you. So this gives uh, Francisco 10 minutes or so to reflect on, on Aisha's excellent paper. So Francisco, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. This, this is, was a much needed paper because uh, anyone who has bothered to, to read the sources as would quickly arrive to the same conclusions that Aisha did, but then working them out into something, you know, putting it out there and publishing, and publishing it was something that uh, was sorely needed. And uh, it is a great read, and I would like to to pick up pick up on it because as as all good scholarship, I think it's worth uh, already to start build upon. And uh, I'd like to, to touch on three points. Uh, I mean, what what has been done uh, with with Schumpeter under the Schumpeter uh, guys? Uh, what uh, could be competition policy under Schumpeterian uh, lens? Which here I I must I must uh, I wouldn't say part ways, but as I said, build up on Asia because I think I think you can do something with it. And uh, finally, you know what what would be the the broader evolution that uh, that this would entail for competition law now. We know that there has been uh, an effort, particularly in the EU, to develop theories of harm based on innovation. And they have had to uh, step aside from the neoclassical framework and just you know, consider market power and so on. So it's, it, it makes sense that, in, in that they, um, they would uh, pull Schumpeter as a reference. And Aisha mentioned several times Federico. He was the person in, you, you don't know this when you read the paper, but he was the intellectual architect of this while working as an economist in the commission's director general for competition. So he was the one that was pushing for this series of harm, uh, of harm to innovation. And the idea uh, of these theories is, as you do see quoted in the paper, that uh, Stepping aside from a market power-based analysis, we should be careful of companies, undertakings that merge with others who uh, have the same capabilities, who have the same innovation capabilities, because uh, these, uh, these capabilities could cannibalize the acquirer's uh, own capabilities. And so in these situations, we should separate the innovation uh, assets. So you know, divest them from the merger and have them acquired by a competitor. 
So this is this requires stepping away from the neoclassical uh, framework because it doesn't involve a market power based analysis. You need to work. You need to uh, handle innovation capabilities. But it is based on 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 several ideas about how uh, what are the incentives to innovate, and so they have they have uh, resorted to Schumpeter, as Aisha exposes uh, wrongly, to my view. So, um, what can we what can we do with Schumpeter? Is this what we can do with Schumpeter in terms of policy analysis? I am not so dismissive of the prospect of of antitrust policy based on Schumpeter as Aisha is, because even though he didn't advance policies uh, himself. He uh, he he was out for knowledge, so he was just trying to explain how the economy ran. And us, uh, as lawyers, obviously he wasn't a lawyer, so he wouldn't be qualified anyways. So us, as lawyers, can build up on his uh, views of the economy, and we we can advance uh, position. We can ask what is competition law viewed through the lens of um, of creative destruction. And uh, a starting point would be uh, Manichaeism. So you, you'd, you'd say, what, what does Schumpeter find advantageous and what does Schumpeter find deleterious in uh, creative destruction? So he attributes it, most of the advantages of the capitalist society to creative destruction. So the, it, it, it satisfies consumers by, by creating new methods of production, by increasing output. By he says that that is the defining characteristic of, of capitalism. So that is that is good, and it's good for consumers. Uh, but people forget the, the destruction side of creative destruction. So he also saw the uh, uncertainty that this puts on investments. He also saw that all the industries uh, would be effectively be wiped out, including their capital investments. And uh, he, he also saw, as Aisha says, uh, that there would be some efforts on a part of, uh, of people to uh, deter this, or to, you might say in his view, to ineffectively <laughs> postpone this, because it would always arrive. But he also saw that this could be uh, problematic for progress. Uh, at the same time, he saw that certain protection from uncertainty was needed. So here, here comes law, because here you have two side, two things that you can operate with, which is restrictions of competition, which are necessary to reduce uncertainty to allow uh, uh, these kind of investments, to allow in the entrepreneurs to come in and to risk. And on the other hand, it can cross to the other way, where these kind of, of, of restrictive measures prevent progress in itself. Now, let me be more specific, uh, if I still have time. I think I do. Uh, let's go area by area of competition law and compare this with uh, what is our framework. So if we start with the area of cartels, it's easy, uh, because he also was not a big fan of cartels. and. But what, you, what we need to understand is why wasn't he, uh, it, why didn't he like cartels? Because exactly, they didn't bring the benefits of creative destruction. They were static. And they would lead to, uh, uh, some, they wouldn't lead to innovation. And this is why he equates, and this is something that, you know, for antitrust scholars is, is, is weird, but in his own mind, it makes perfect sense. That's why he equates cartels with perfect competition. He puts cartels in perfect competition in the same bag because they are both two systems which are static. Things don't change. No new products are, are around. Uh, he, and so to his mind, these, uh, when he says that uh, perfect competition is not preferable to creative destruction, he also says that cartels are not preferable to creative destruction. Both of them are static uh, and they don't lead to progress. So in his view, of course, he would he would sign with cartel busting. He wouldn't have any problem with that. Uh, so that part of the law uh, is still valid under a creative destruction uh, point of view. Now, if we go to abuse, 
we have we have a problem that you know what is dominance he would say that you know the the methods that we use to assess dominance based on market power are are not um are not valid however he didn't dismiss that there can be monopoly positions that were stable i know i have one minute magali let me just finish um he didn't dismiss he says this isn't likely without the backup of the state but it is he, he didn't dismiss this outright. So it is possible to have stable positions of monopoly power. Uh, dominant companies do, uh, do obtain regulatory advantages. And uh, he did mention patents as a way. So he also admitted technology, even though they don't have the same weight as, as, as they do in current analysis. So he also admitted that they, that they could have an advantage. So he, there, is, there is room to... Um, there is room to have uh, criticism of dominant companies. Also, the theories of harm involved would have to be the ones that uh, prevent innovation. And this leads me to mergers, and this is my last thought. Now, the, the, merger, uh, the merger framework that is involved in the EU is based on a, a positive effect. As Shapiro and Federico have said, it's the prospect of uh, profit that, of market power that spurs innovation. This is a complete misreading of Schumpeter. So better, it's a negative incentive. It's the incentive of being destroyed that makes people innovate. If they don't innovate, they will die. So from that point of view, when you look at the so-called killer mergers, the ones where they acquire uh, innovation capabilities, you can have three conclusions. And these are the last things I will say. The first conclusion is that um, when you divest, that is not creative destruction, because then you assume that the, the, the company that, that is acquiring, so the, the competitor that is acquiring, and the competitor that gets uh, the divested assets will continue to compete with each other. Now, in creative destruction, one of them will perish. So this doesn't make any sense. Secondly, in a scenario of a killer acquisition, the entrepreneur is the acquired. The acquirer is the capitalist. So under, Schupe, under, Schupe, under Schupeter's view, there is no support for privileging uh, the capitalist in this situation. So he, he would have no problem in all of the mergers that, that, uh, that are being blocked because they're killer acquisitions, so to speak. Uh, he'd be... You know, the entrepreneur already done the entrepreneurship. He's already in business. This is just a capitalist time to acquire the entrepreneur. So why should we protect it? Why should we have any concerns about competition authorities coming in and saying we can't have this acquisition? Because if the capitalist is acquiring, it can only be because it's trying to uh, stall process uh, progress. And um, finally, uh, my third view is, again, in relation to entrepreneurship, but I think we can return to entrepreneurship later with the debate. Thanks, Francisco. Um, I'm going to build on that, and I'm going to try to pull it back. Right. What? Sorry, Magali. Yeah? Do I have just a few minutes to 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 note a few things uh, that based on Francisco's uh, comments? Sure. Um, or or if you want to, yeah, yeah, no, go on, go on. Uh, just just to to give you also like a yeah. A sort of a fuller, fuller view, I suppose. Uh, and I have to admit that Francisco and I had many discussions about this paper. <laughs> so he knows it quite well at this stage. But I just wanted to mention that uh, he's definitely, he did, he was concerned about the destruction side of uh, creative destruction, that is true. But he wasn't concerned in the sense that we should avoid it. It was more that this is the only policy prescription that is sort of discernible from his work is employment benefits, because he saw that when you know, industries were distracted, people would would, um, would be unemployed. And in order to avoid social upheaval, uh, governments should invest in uh, unemployment benefits. And this is, I mean, actually in the in economic history, he's pitched against Keynes in terms of his, not Arrow. We have a narrow vision with Arrow versus Schumpeter, but in the, in the in economic theory, he's pitched in this context more against Keynes. And um, in terms of the restrictive, uh, restrictive uh, measures, uh, he did. Uh, it's true that he said there, are, you know, there might be all pervading cartels that that have no redeeming virtues. But at the same time, he also 
saw Standard Oil to be a work of genius. So he was the Standard Oil Trust that gave rise to, you know, the, or the likes of which that gave rise to to antitrust laws in the first place. He saw uh, this as a new new type of organization that actually uh, that actually was a work of genius. So I think he he his vision of what is what is unredeemable was actually very, very narrow in my interpretation of his work. And, um, and he did also, um, yeah, so just one last thing about acquisitions is the idea that I think back in the day, uh, maybe we didn't have this, um, you know, the, 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 the relationship between, you know, big tech companies and smaller entrepreneurs as it is today. It was, a, it was an earlier version of capitalism, let's, let's face it. But I'm also thinking that this might also fit into his venture capital model as opposed to seeing these acquisitions as something, something that is bad for competition. He might have interpreted these as a way to, to actually uh, finance innovation, but we'll never know because he didn't say, I, I, at least as far as I know, he didn't say anything explicit about it. The only thing I know is that he expected big concerns to fight progress that would uh, basically distract them, but he didn't find this, I mean, he, he didn't find this to be problematic and he puts patents on equal measure with everything that we find to be restrictive uh, in the neoclassical context, uh, you know, restrictive practices, monopolistic practices. He, and he says, you know, we allow patents, then why not allow these restrictive practices that serve the same purpose in the end? That's it. Thank you very much. So I'm going to just pull it back a little and then we can open the floor and have a bit of a discussion as well with the audience, if the audience has questions. So when I was reading your paper, um, I was struck by how it rendered the debate of Schumpeter and competition policy irrelevant. And, and I just want to I want to talk about that a little. So to me, the way I, I read your interpretation of Schumpeter's work was this perfect competition is a irrealistic irrelevant, inferior measure. It is a theoretical model, but it doesn't exist in reality. And in reality, it would probably not achieve the social outcomes that it would want. And I think the social outcomes of, of a capitalist society with the entrepreneur as its hero is quite an, an important feature, which isn't something that we really look at in our perfect competition model. So if that's true, if what Schumpeter was arguing was against this, this economic theory, then the question becomes the extent to which it is relevant to competition policy. First, it could be relevant by saying that, well, we are working towards a wrong ideal. And my students um, um, always hear me talking about how I'm going to teach them about perfect competition and how this is the ideal and the benefits it brings and how it will never, ever happen in real life. Maybe we are barking up the wrong tree, maybe we are working towards an ideal that, that doesn't exist and that in fact, if it did exist, would have outcomes that we hadn't expected because we've just theorized this model rather than known what it looked like in practice. If that is the case, either we adapt and we adapt our ideal and we've got these concepts of workable competition, but they're still very much in line with this neoclassical model or we just have to come up with a completely new justification of what we're working towards in competition policy. And let's be realistic, none of us wants to do that because we, we, we're quite comfortable with what we have, right? So if we want to be honest to Schumpeter, we need to completely you know, throw out the baby with the bathwater and start from scratch, which I don't think we're gonna do. And then the question is, does it matter that we're being intellectually dishonest in the way we interpret Schumpeter? In actual fact, most of the things we use, most of the economic theory we bring into law, we lie. I lie to my students every day I teach them. This is not how this theory is. We leave out the details. We completely gloss over the fine points. So if that's the question, then maybe it's good enough that Schumpeter inspired pe people to start thinking about how innovation and creative destruction fits into competition policy, even if, um, if he would come out of his grave now, he would just go back in it because he'd be frustrated by the way we interpreted him. If I write a paper and people misinterpret it, but it launches a completely new field, do you know what? I'm fine with that. I'm totally fine with that. So... If that's the case, if we are going to be intellectually dishonest, it's good to know we're being intellectually dishonest, but maybe it doesn't matter. It does matter when we um, take one of his statements as gospel and then use it to justify action. But if it just inspires people to do more research empirically and theoretically, then maybe it doesn't matter. 
uh, which is, 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 is terrible to say. But being intellectually dishonest is the bread and butter of a lot of, of the ways we translate economic theory into law. And maybe that's OK. So then the question is, why do we care about innovation? And how are we going to interpret it? Uh, Francisco, I kind of disagree with you on the innovation capabilities thing here. So maybe we can debate that. When we talk about innovation capabilities, I think we are talking about market power. And we are deviating from this, this model of perfect competition in the sense that we're, we're looking at those people who have the incentives and the power to innovate. It's a different way of looking at market power, but maybe that's what we're supposed to be doing. If we're going to stick with the perfect competition model, we just have to adapt it to innovation. And yes, Schumpeter wouldn't like it, but that's what we have to do if we want to stick with it. It would be more fruitful probably for society rather than for our discipline if we were going to honestly look at the economy and the societal benefits that we want to create to competition policy but we might face the uncomfortable truth that competition policy is not the right tool or an effect that effective in creating a better society um, and that's a quite a, a problematic thing for all of us in our profession Francisco disagrees so I think this is a good a good starting point should we should we care about from Peter in the sense that should we be honest about them? And would that prompt us to have to rethink the, the things we are working towards? Or should we just leave Schumpeter behind and say, you know what, it doesn't matter that we're lying about what he said. If I may jump in here, and I'm gonna take Vinicius' uh, st uh, uh, comment as, as the starting point. The protection of creative destruction as the main objective of a Schumpeterian competition law. That's 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 how I see it, Vinicius. That's how I see it. And let me explain. Now, the idea that we're teaching competition law because we have we want to have an ideal of perfect competition is not true. That is something that has uh, been foisted on us by uh, economists, by the Chicago School, by neoclassicism. And the, trying to squeeze in innovation or market power is... Uh, I would say Magali, but that's that's something we can argue uh, between ourselves. That's that's in the same vein. Now, competition law prohibited cartels before it had an economic theory of perfect competition. The model that and Schumpeter would be very attuned to this because this is a man who has wrote the reference work on this uh, on the history of uh, economic thought, uh, collated by his wife. Uh, which mustn't be forgotten, as, as Aisha said, he knows that the biggest step is, is, the, is, for, is the capitalist society evolving from medieval society of guilds and cartels. So the problem is static, and that's why he doesn't like uh, perfect competition, because he sees it as static as a cartel. But the problem is static, so we need to protect creative destruction. Now, a first reading would be, we don't need to do anything. Creative destruction would, would always occur. But he, as Aisha says, he doesn't make policy recommendations. This is what he thinks. He says, he look, we need to look at this through decades. Let's look at this through decades. It is true that he was in favor of Standard Oil, but Standard Oil was new at the time. And they were doing things that people didn't do before. They were having connections with railroads. They were doing things that he would say, well, they're just... You know, they're just building, they're just innovating, they're just trying to uh, control the uncertainty so that so that they can offer new things. But let's look at tech nowadays. It's been 20 years over the iPhone, 20 years over the Google search engine. Okay, we are we are talking about the decades that he mentioned. And is there progress? And or are we in a situation which is akin to the cartel harm of having a static environment? Now, Aisha is right that he was also worried about employment, so he would also be uh, concerned with, you know, the effects of this kind of, you know, digitization, which is promoting massive unemployment and so on. So he would have seen the, but that's not the point here. The point is this, for a Schumpeterian co competition law, we need to preserve the act of creative destruction because a monopolist who successfully stops progress is the same type as the cartelists and the perfect competition that he uh, criticizes. He doesn't exclude that a monopolist can achieve this. 
And in relation to mergers, I have to disagree with Aisha. He would not see this as an extension of the VC uh, system because the VC, uh, the, the venture capital system has progressed. It exists now beyond his wildest dreams. So that market is already available. So when WhatsApp is bought by, uh, by uh, Facebook, it is not, as, as some articles have said, said you know, incentivizing the entrepreneurs thinking that they will be bought out by uh, a major company. It is trying to stop progress because it is the capital, it, it, the, the, the acquirer, Facebook, is at the, is the same time the capitalist he's acquiring, but he is also the incumbent. So obviously, this is a measure to try to stop progress. They are trying to protect themselves from creative destruction successfully. And all of the benefits of creative destruction uh, get uh, stolen from uh, by these kind of measures. So, so yes, uh, I would say that there is, as Vinicius says, there is room for creative destruction as an, uh, protecting creative destruction as an objective of competition law. And that is not protecting rent, as, as Aisha rightly says in her paper, but it's simply watching out for those practices where monopolists and cartels try to introduce static environments. Magali, do you want to jump in? Okay, well, um, we can agree to disagree, I suppose, <laughs> because, yeah, it's true that if Schumpeter saw the venture capital landscape of today, he would in my opinion, like if he went to the Silicon Valley, he would probably love it. Um, and he it was it would be beyond his wildest dreams. But at the same time, his vision, so I'm now going back to business cycles and and he saw creative destruction not as like a one kind of thing happening over and over again, but also in different waves. Uh, and this is yeah, this is his business cycle theory, which I don't claim to know very well. It's a huge book that I read only partially and, and read about in the work, for example, in the work of Carlota Perez, uh, whose work I love, but also he was very much aware of the, the longer waves uh, of technological change that, you know, completely, completely displaced the way we, we do things. And this digitalization, the internet and this digitalization is, is, is one example. So he saw paradigm shifts, but he also saw smaller shifts uh, in, in different degrees. And I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure he would be. I mean, we 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 can't know. I'm not sure he would be particularly worried about uh, you know capitalists acquiring entrepreneurs. But at the same time, I think it could be seen as a sign of uh, capitalism going to its demise. Because when we read the chapters on the demise of capitalism going to so socialism, this is the kind of uh, picture I am seeing. You know. Pro creative destruction becoming a function of of big business and this is the thing about facebook and google etc acquiring uh, companies we also for example when google acquired youtube uh, youtube is a we could think of it as a as a as a creative destruction in some ways it was definitely a very innovative product but it was about to fail because of uh copyrights uh copyrights uh, lawsuits against it so what is also, I think, what what something that we need to think about is whether these companies are the ones deciding what will be the next disruptive thing. And their acquisition, uh, I think, their acquisition strategy is definitely, to, at least to a certain extent, fit into that vision because we saw now Facebook, for example, changing to uh, Meta and you know pushing for the metaverse universe. But maybe it's a universe that we wouldn't pick up we are picking it up maybe just because Facebook is pushing it. So I think it, we also need to think about who decides the direction of technology in a society. And is it being decided today by the existing capitalists or is it being decided today by grassroots entrepreneurs? And I think this is the kind of thing that Schumpeter, this, this shift from the grassroots entrepreneur to the, to the bigger concern was something he saw um, as sort of going to, the, in, in mature capitalism, and potentially going to the collapse of capitalism. And I'm not sure, um, we maybe uh, the kind of competition policy that you're proposing is maybe a way for us 
to or uh, I'm not personally adhering to this, I'm afraid, but maybe it's a way to protect capitalism from its own <laughs> own demise. Uh, maybe we just want to have capitalism, the cake of capitalism and eat it too, you know, uh, uh, and keep it, try, try and keep it. But I'm not sure this is going to be um, I, honestly, I mean, I, I think about this a lot, but I, my thoughts are very scattered in that regard in the sense that in the grand scheme of things, how sustainable is this going to be? I'm not using sustainability in the, you know, in the, in the, um, in the overly used context of international politics, but in the sense that, well, for example, in Schumpeter's day, as Francisco was saying, of course, uh, it was, uh, I mean, he was very much thinking about consumer needs uh, and consumer demands and ever evolving consumer demands being met by you know ever the ever evolving capitalist system but that's as we know today which he didn't know at the time was that the earth the earth has boundaries and we are not maybe we are not going to be able to do it for much longer and in terms of just i wanted to um i want to just have one side note if and once again i'm not I, I, I don't feel I'm adhering to the sort of the, the capabilities approach in competition. And Francisco, you, Francisco has an excellent paper on this as well, for those who, who want to, to read his views in more detail on the capabilities approach. And I think Petit and Thies's work also fits into that scheme. Yes, if we are to have a Schumpeterian competition, if, it's, if it is what matters, I think going in that direction makes sense. But once again, that would be, in my opinion, intellectually dishonest, even though Magali says, and I, I totally hear you. I mean, it's the same with Adam Smith. It's the same, same with Coase. Uh, we take things and we use them as we want to use them. And if we do the same with Schumpeter, uh, and maybe as Magali says, he wouldn't care. He would just be happy about his name being dropped uh, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> then the capabilities approach, and this goes way beyond just looking at what patents, and this is the other thing. Uh, I mean, competition economics looks a lot at patents when measuring innovation, and for me, this is just, uh, aside from the fact that it's not Schumpeterian at all, it's also, it doesn't make any sense in the current context of digital markets. And innovation capabilities just goes much beyond what patents a company has. It's, it's, it's a, it's a wide-ranging uh, scale of capabilities that, of course, we uh, was developed in, in business literature. So I think there is definitely potentially work to be more work to be done in that in that sphere. Um, yeah, Eduard, Eduardo has one question, but if you want to jump in, yeah, before that, um, please do. I'll, uh, I'll just say um, I just want to side note Francisco about economists foisting perfect competition on us. True, but competition law before economists foisted anything upon us was special interest legislation. Maybe that's why we are currently in this weird flux in our field. Maybe we should just be honest that what we're doing is special interest legislation. If we don't adhere to an economic model like an ideal of perfect competition, where we're saying that, okay, competition law is here to protect the entrepreneur, Jim Peter would love that, right? Protect the entrepreneur, make sure capitalism doesn't become a system that needs to be overthrown. Okay, but then let's be honest that that's what's, what, we're, what we are doing. The, the idea of perfect competition being foisted upon us was so that we would be more protected against the critique of it being special interest legislation, but maybe it's not a critique. Maybe we've come to a point in, 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 in our economic evolution where special interest legislation is what we need. And that's kind of what the abuse of economic dependent things in, in France and Germany are all about. So maybe we're just trying to solve the question with the wrong tools. Um, and that kind of goes to the innovation capabilities idea. We're trying to, we're really trying to fit things into to our model as we use it now. And I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of that. I mean, I don't feel bad about it, but that's what I'm doing in the book I'm currently writing. I'm trying to fit it within the system we have. But I'm totally fine with people blowing up the system. But if this is the system we have, then we have to make it work. If not, let's be honest and make a completely more honest competition law that protects the entrepreneur. Um, so that's, that's, that's kind of, when I was listening to you two and going back and forth, I was thinking, eh, it really depends on what we're doing um, rather than, than, than integration, Peter, or not. Um, but I think it's a, a good idea. So we got a question in the chat. 
by Eduardo, which is, can the dominant player allocate resources to limit or even eliminate a maverick acquiring the entrepreneur or hiring them under Schumpeterian theory? So um, I guess the first question is, his actual theory or the competition law version of Schumpeter? Uh, Aisha, do you want to come in? Sorry. Yeah. Um, one thing I'd like to mention is that the killer acquisition in this in the sphere, the killer acquisition um, uh, thing, I think was blown a bit out of proportion uh, in our discourse in general. I mean, in the in the in the competition or discourse because um, it's it was shown in the ph pharmaceutical context, but in the digital market context, we know that this it's not. I mean. Uh, companies startups aren't acquired to to be shelved and not i mean at least most of the time and i mean i'm saying uh, i'd like to continue with some of my experience talking to startups and companies uh because i did this i did my field work basically talking to 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 startups and startups that i found to be potentially uh, disrupted basically and and for them it is really and it's not really a hype uh being acquired is really a um a, a, a very sensible way forward basically which is i think from missing we see it from the competition we see this from the competition lens as as um you know big companies trying to throttle innovation but what happens in the in the actual scene of uh, venture capital and in the actual scene of you know innovation um it's very different from from our lens, I think, and this is also it would be more in fitting with with, with the Schumpeterian, the actual Schumpeterian lens, in my opinion, because there are many factors that go into this. For example, also the the venture capitalists have a very huge say in what happens to the startup, basically, what happens to the startup as it is being developed. So to an exit, uh, an acquisition exit is a very, very sensible way forward, or even for startups who, who come up with, you know, great ideas, and, and they, they have the vision to, to get things going, but the same, but then after a certain stage, they get to a point where growing is not in their interest anymore. They don't feel like they can sort of expand expand the company on their own. And in that context, again, being acquired being acquired by a big company makes sense. But we are going. Um, uh, I mean, it's not. And in these in these contexts, we see them also being integrated into the into the well, the dominant player or the big tech, whatever it is, integrated into their system. And when they are not integrated, sometimes it's because the idea simply fails. I mean, it doesn't have traction. Maybe it gets a lot of traction at the outset, but then it just wanes off because users don't sim simply don't like the product. And this is these dynamics, in my opinion, Schumpeter, I think, would love to would have loved to you know get more into these dynamics. But I think a lot of these, and I'm just briefly mentioning some of them. I think a lot of these dynamics are just completely missing from from the competition now uh competitional sort of landscape and we see this basically this very hostile approach toward big tech companies and i'm not sure this is the right way forward basically like especially uh in the eu it's very different of course but if you look at the us the the the, the coming uh you know the ongoing uh lawsuits for example or the you know house of representatives investigation on competition and in digital markets it's very I mean, it's very, in my opinion, barren in this context. I mean, we can't just cite a few, uh, <laughs> we can't just cite a few venture capitalists and a few, you know, walks or uh, tech crunch articles and say that we we completely understand this 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 field, basically. Anyways, again, I talk too much. If I can come in, if I can come in quickly, uh, the these acquisitions when there is an acquisition of whatsapp and when there's an acquisition facebook acquires whatsapp face facebook acquires instagram why is schumpeter useful in as a lens it is useful because we see that there is no destruction when these acquisitions are taking place so there is no creative destruction because when facebook acquires WhatsApp or acquires Instagram, it has no plans to shelve its old social network. Their plans is to integrate it in a system where all of its preceding value is preserved. They don't want the destructive side of the creation side. 
Hence, Schumpeter gives us a good tool to object to these kind of deals. They are trying to stall progress. They don't want the destruction. Now, I'm going to tease Aisha, and I'm going to say, if Schumpeter would come back today, he would be a hipster, he'd be a hipster uh, antitrust lawyer. Now, he would be scandalous with their lack of imagination, but we must remember that he was a contrarian. So he would align with the contrarian view. And he is also very sensitive to the fact of what's the, what's the support in the populace of the capitalist system. So he would realize that it is losing support. So he, as, as, as Aisha said, as a defender of capitalism, would be on the side of the people trying to rehabilitate capitalism. So he would be, he would be criticizing uh, big tech if he knew that this was buying a lease a, a little more, uh, some years of life uh, to, uh, for the capitalist system, which, which, which it might, which it might. Uh, the entrepreneur, uh, as uh, coming back to Magali's, uh, fi finally to come back to Magali's comments, what's the goal of competition law? We have a system which has been read as protecting the entrepreneur against the, um, against the, the conglomerate, the big, the big firm, the bureaucratic firm, which in Schumpeter's view is uh, fighting this, uh, fighting the, the big firm is what makes capitalism live longer. So why wouldn't, why wouldn't it be fit for purpose? Why wouldn't it be fit for purpose? It would, you would just need to come back to Europe. Can I, can I before I let Aisha, can I just say that, uh, I mean, I think we have very different views on what the current state of the law is. And I think it's probably because I teach US, UK and EU competition law, and I study German and French competition law. And I'm telling you that I don't think there's a consensus what the state of EU competition law is. Yeah, you could read it as protecting the entrepreneur against big power, but you could read it in, in so many ways that it's like Schumpeter and Adam Smith. You could read it in a way that suits you. I, uh, I, I'm in Glasgow. I teach my students about Adam Smith and I tell them, this is how I read it. This is not how most people read it. That's why I like, I like old, old, old literature. That point aside, you're saying that, you know, it's uh, that there's voices against capitalism, but I think this fits in with Aisha's interpretation of we should spend more than a century before we um, evaluate Schumpeter's accuracy. I mean, yes, but when the Sherman Act was passed, there were voices against capitalism as well. We've had voices against capitalism as the spur for competition policy for almost, all, for over a century, for almost two centuries, if we take it very broadly. Special interest legislation and competition policy in the US, for example, with the Robinson Patman Act, has been the main, you know, trying to address why everybody hates capitalism and why it's still a good idea. Should that really be what we base competition policy on? Because then we might as well throw it, you know, give up. We might as well give up. So this is just one point. I don't think your interpretation of um, Schumpeter being happy if he sees that we're trying to protect the entrepreneur against market power is accurate because I think he would have wanted us to look at the incentives that come from the promise that you will be bought up by a big power. Um, but maybe this the, the, the reason here is that we're not separating the funding question from the social mobility question. So maybe Schumpeter would just look at us and think, what are you even talking about? None of this is relevant to what I was saying, which brings me back to do we even care that it's not what he was saying. He, he would look at social mobility. That's it. That you just you just hit the, the nail on the head. This is what I'm saying. The, under creative destruction, what is the incentive of the entrepreneur? When Federico says, oh, it's the prospects of market power, this is just Chicago people trying to repackage non-interventionism. Okay. Now, under Schumpeter, it's a negative incentive. So you want to avoid being destroyed. So you need to survive this evolution, the evolutionary aspect that Aisha highlights very well in her paper. And also there is the social, there is the social rewards that come from it. So the, the, there, is no, there is no promise in the entrepreneur of the buyout in terms of having, uh, of, of having market share or having financial profit. It is only, but socially, you might, Aisha has been talking to these people, might, they might be a big feather on their cap to be bought by, uh, you know, by, a big, by a big firm, but the experience of a lot of them have after being big bought is that they quit. 
And do they want to be Elon Musk or do they want to be, you know, the head of WhatsApp or the head of Instagram that were bought by Facebook and no one knows who they are now? I don't know. Can I just point out that you've basically said the consumer welfare standard is irrelevant, which I'm, I'm fine with. But if what we're doing is social mobility, that might come at the cost of consumer benefit, right? So you, we have to be clear that that's not what we're trying to achieve. And I'm okay with that. But that's a that's quite a, an important statement to make, no? So anyway, I shall cut you up. Uh, no worries. I was thinking you gave me things to think about, although I'm not sure I can properly address them here. But all, all I can say, I suppose, is that the maybe it's 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 not even worth thinking about what Schumpeter would say um, would say uh, you know what happens when 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 you know big companies buy smaller ones is this like hampering creative destruction etc because again it depends on what are we trying to achieve in the world right what is our vision of the world and what are we trying to push Schumpeter can give us elements about how the capitalist system works and we can use them to sort of craft the future we want to craft although I'm not sure the future I would like to craft has anything to do with what happens with the acquisitions that's the, that's the real thing at the same time um yeah yeah I, I do clearly i do enjoy getting into those debates and that's why i like to talk to startups and how they see uh things evolving and i can say two things one we could see we could i think in my head i've been grouping people into two categories basically one of them is startups that are just creating things purely to either complement big tech companies i'm just talking about digital sphere by the way uh complement big tech companies and of course the ultimate goal and they don't say this to the venture cap capitalists all, all the time because it's also important for the venture capitalists to see potential growth in a, in a in a startup then if they don't see that potential growth uh happening maybe it's a better idea to 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 exit with an acquisition and there, of course, clearly acquisition becomes a, a very important factor in a startup thinking. The second is the startups that are actually uh, clearly creating um, the creative destruction, I will say. And they, at least they have the vision to create something entirely new. And I suppose there we can think about whether the acquisitions uh, that we are concerned with, they kill the creation happening in that in that context and i'm not sure that's the case really and uh, and if that's not the case then why should we bother about um you know somebody already had something had you know somebody starting already with a potential product to be sold to amazon uh and then that product again you know ended up being sold to amazon but uh, yeah the real question is i suppose do they really hamper creative destruction? Do these, do these acquisitions really hamper creative destruction or not? And about, on a side note, um, I think the, the, the whole neo Brandesian debate uh, is actually fits into Schumpeter's um, vision of, again, the collapse of capitalism because he, a, it's not just a theory of entrepreneurial decline. I mean, the, the, the chapters on uh, the collapse of capitalism go on and on. And there he also talks about the intellectual strata uh, completely uh, and its discontent about capitalism. And these, this intellectual strata neither belongs to the capitalist class nor the class that is, that is uh, hurt by the capitalist class. And there somewhere, you know, some uh, somewhere next to the whole you know whole dynamics of capitalists and those uh, hurt by the capitalists and they are the ones expressing discontent and they are the ones that create popular discontent against uh, capitalism <laughs> and when i read those chapters i don't know you might disagree with me but that's what i was immediately thinking thinking about and and he also of course criticized them for being like completely uh, they blames them for not understanding how the capitalist dynamics work. So we're at the end of our time, and I think that's actually a brilliant um, and, and a controversial place to end. Maybe we, the intellectuals, are just hyping up unhappiness about capitalism, and we should just all start shutting up. Um, 
but I think it's a it's a it's an interesting thing to ponder at the end uh, at the end of this panel. And thank you very much. I think everybody will now flock to the paper, which, by the way, is brilliantly written. So um, if you want to read uh, Ash's paper, it's available on SSRN. And um, I think both Francisco and I and Aisha are always happy to have further debates about uh, innovation, creative destruction, and whether what we're doing is pointless. Uh, so I uh, I look forward to seeing you all in the future and uh, continue enjoying the IBCI conference. Talk to you later. Obrigado. Boa conferência. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone.